And as we prepare to receive the word for this morning, let us pray together the prayer for illumination. Together, guide us, O Lord, Lord, by your word, by your and, word Holy and Holy Spirit, that in, in your light we may see light, see light. In, your truth. in your truth, find freedom, and, freedom. and in, in your, your will, will discover, discover peace, peace through, through Jesus Christ, Christ our, Lord. our Lord. Amen. Please be seated as I hand the time over to Pastor Tsui. Thank you, Jenny, and the musicians for leading us in a time of worship in music. And we come now to worship God in the listening of His Word. And we follow our, we continue in our sermon series on God Cares, and today we come to God Cares for the Bullied. And our scripture text comes from Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 to 16, where you hear now the Word of the Lord. Exodus 17, beginning from verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the years of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, the names have been changed, but the experiences are real. Suresh was a boy who faced some learning and speech difficulty. In his school, his classmates ostracized him. A gang of them often played unkind pranks on him and even beat him. Teachers knew, but did not do anything about it. Gina. Gina was someone in the arts industry who was very competent in her work. But it turns out that she held quite different values from the people around her. She felt that there were some things that they were advocating which was not in line with what she believed to be true and right. Because of her view, which became a minority view in the industry that she was in, she was often ostracized, she was talked down, she was denied opportunities. Brenda. Brenda had left her home country, she came to Singapore to earn a living as a domestic helper but she began to be scolded by her employers for every little mistake. They started beating her. In a Harvard Business Review article, it was reported, and I quote, the stereotypical workplace bully is the aggressive boss demeaning a quiet team member. But bullying is ultimately about power and positional authority is only one power source. According to the Workplace Bullying Institute, 14% of all workplace bullying in the US is upward, or bullying of managers by subordinates, unquote. Different people, different circumstances, all bullied. We put together all the definitions from various dictionaries. Bullying is the behavior of a person or a group of people who hurts or frightens someone perceived to be smaller or less powerful. The Bible is emphatic that God cares for the bullied. And we see this expressly revealed in the story of His chosen nation in the Old Testament, which is Israel. And today's sermon will be a little bit of a history lesson from the Scriptures. And we will see from this history how when Israel was bullied, God cared for the bullied and saved Israel. We will also see that when Israel was the bully, God cared for the bully and punished Israel. God does not change. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. God cares for the bullied. 
The story in our scripture today took place in the 1300s BC or perhaps earlier. This was really not too long after God had saved the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. And in this story, we read that the Israelites encountered a military threat from Amalek and his army. In a later reference to this attack in Deuteronomy, this was said of the Amalekites. Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and struck down all who lagged behind you. He did not fear God. So Amalek, like the Pharaoh of Egypt, did not fear God, and he opposed God's will to bless his people. Amalek saw Israel as a weaker people and led his army to attack them in their vulnerability. But this was not the first military threat that the Israelites faced since the exodus from Egypt. Their first military threat is recorded just three chapters before our story today. In Exodus 14, the Pharaoh, who had just been overwhelmed by the power of God and released the Israelites to leave Egypt, he changed his mind. The absence of slaves to do his bidding was too much for him and his officials to bear. And so he led his army to pursue the Israelites. And the Egyptians pressed in and they, they pressed in to the point that they forced the Israelites to choose between three options drown in the Red Sea, or die by Egyptian swords, or become slaves again. Two military threats that opposed the will of God to prosper his people very early on in the people's journey to the promised land. Two military powers that reflected a blatant disregard of the Lord as the God King of the Israelites and who would try to assert their dominance by bullying a people. Two military threats, two similar outcomes. They were defeated and God's people was protected and prevailed. And more significantly, the Lord revealed to both the Israelites and the surrounding nations just who He is and what kind of God He is. He revealed that the Lord is the one true God, the creator God of all the earth, the God who has control over the forces and elements of nature, the sovereign God who determines human destiny, and the faithful God who keeps His promise to His people in steadfast love. This is the God who is both willing and able to protect and preserve His people from forces that seek to rob them of lives. This is the God who cares for the bullied. And this is the same God that we know and worship today as His people. Now, like the similarities between the two episodes, the differences between them also reveal something about God and us as His people. In the case of the Egyptian threat, God's word to His people through Moses was this. He said, do not be afraid, stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to keep still. And so all the people had to do facing the Egyptians was to keep still and then watch. Watch as Moses stretched out his staff over the sea. Watch as the Red Sea parted and then walk through the parted Red Sea. And then when they on the other side, to keep still again and watch the Egyptian army panic as their chariots got stuck they kept still and they watched Moses stretch out his hands and they watched the Red Sea swallow and decimate the Egyptian pursuers. The Israelites did not have to fight that battle. Other than Moses acting as his human agent and the flight of the Israelites across the bed of the Red Sea, God acted unilaterally to save his people. But in the case of the Amalekite threat, the Israelites had to fight. As instructed by Moses, some men were chosen and led by Joshua to fight the enemy while Moses stood on top of the hill with the staff of God in his hand. And they had to fight. Two military threats, two different actions called of God's people. In the Egyptian threat, stillness and flight was called for. In the Amalekite threat, active fight was called for. Yet it is clearly recognised in both episodes that God was intimately involved in the protection and deliverance of His people. Stillness and action, fight and flight, these were all used by God in His will for the well-being of His people. And God cares for the bullied. The battle against the bullies belongs to the Lord. 
But now a persistent problem with our sinful world is that the bigger, stronger, or richer person has the tendency to uh, bully the smaller, weaker, or poorer. And God knows that even Israel is no different. And so God gave Israel a set of laws to guide them in their behaviour, in the way that re they related with one another, in the way that they should live. And this set of laws showed God's opposition to bullying and His care for the bullied. And so, for example, in Exodus 23 and Leviticus 19, God laid down laws prohibiting people from the following. He prohibited people from slandering others, from behaving like the majority when the majority is in the wrong, from taking bribes and depriving victims of justice, from oppressing foreigners. There was a law that even prohibited us, the people, from cursing the deaf or tripping the blind. In short, God prohibited actions that endangered lives and deprived people of justice. But aside from prohibitions, God also instituted laws that required His people to ensure everyone, including foreign workers, had adequate rest and refreshment on the Sabbath. He instituted laws that required His people to provide for the care and sustenance of the disadvantaged and marginalised instead of taking more and more from them. Now, one would think that with such laws, and one would think that having once been bullied themselves and being saved from bullying by God, the people of Israel would be the best example to the world of a just society in which there is no bullying. But a sad turn in history saw Israel forsaking God and turning away from His laws. And as Israel grew as a nation, the bullied, became the bully. Even then, God showed himself to be the God who is just and cares for the bullied. God would oppose the bully, even if the bully was his specially chosen nation. And this was God's verdict regarding bullying in Israel. In Isaiah 1, God said, See how the faithful city has become a prostitute, someone who turns away from God and to other gods. She once was full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her but now murderers. Your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless, the widow's case. In other words, the, the case of the victims and of marginalised people do not come before them. And then in Isaiah 10, God will again say, Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. Now Israel had become a nation of bullies and because Israel became a nation of bullies, God judged her guilty and punished her. God raised up the nations of Assyria and Babylon as his instruments of judgment on Israel and they invaded Israel. And by 586 BC, the whole of Israel was exiled from the land. Now, if a bully ever thinks that God will somehow favour them and be on his side because of his riches, his status, his power, or even his nationality, or if a bully somehow thinks that he should be pitied while he bullies others because he was once bullied, he is sorely mistaken. God is never on the side of bullies. He is always on the side of justice. God cares for the bullied. Now from this brief survey of the ancient history of Israel as God's chosen nation, to reveal something of Himself, what does it mean for us today? Well, firstly, it means that if you are bullying someone, stop it. The reason that you have not been judged yet is an act of God's mercy on you. Really, He's giving you a chance to repent, a chance to make things right with those you are bullying. And if you do not do that, there will come a day when God will oppose you with the full arm of His justice. Like the Pharaoh and his army that were annihilated in the Red Sea, like the Amalekites that were routed by those they bullied, that day will be a terrible day for you. But God does not delight in punishing people. 
Rather, the Bible tells us God desires by far for bullies to know their sin and to repent from their sin. God said, in repentance, you shall be saved. God wants to raise himself up to show mercy to you. So if you are a bully, don't harden your hearts anymore. Know that bullying is a wicked thing to do and repent from it. And as you turn to God for forgiveness, he will surely forgive you. He will relent from punishing you. And God will even lead you into a life of peace and joy without having to assert yourself over others anymore. And so firstly, if you are a bully, if you are treating somebody so unkindly so as to hurt them or frighten them, turn to God for mercy and stop bullying. Secondly, the history of ancient Israel with God means that if you are the bullied, God cares for you. It matters to God that you are being bullied and He is not turning a blind eye to it. Even now, God will help you if you will trust Him and follow what He guides you to do. He may not punish or remove the bully yet, but He will save you. And sometimes, like the Israelites fleeing from the Egyptians through the Red Sea, God will help you by opening a way for you to distance yourself from the bully. And to distance yourself from the bully, sometimes that may involve you having to make difficult decisions, just as the Israelites had to make the difficult decision of crossing the Red Sea. We may think that it was easy, but I suppose if you can imagine the scene, it wouldn't have been an easy thing. You, would, you wouldn't know whether the sea would come crashing down on you as you cross the bed. But they made the difficult decision, and perhaps what distancing ourselves from bullies might mean is to move out of our schools, our workplaces, or perhaps even out of our current residence to find a new one away from the bully. And God will open that way for you. In other cases, God helps you by giving you strength and opportunity to stand up to the bully appropriately. And this could mean standing your ground and calling out the bullying behaviour. Or it could mean reporting the bully to the appropriate authorities like your teachers or the police. And it does take courage to do that. We don't know what will happen to us. We don't know the outcome. We don't know whether the teachers or the police can even do anything about it at the end. But we can take courage and just do it and leave the outcome to God. So sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. But at all times, pray to God. Speak to Him honestly about the problem. Tell him honestly how you are feeling, whether you are sad, frightened, hurt. And then ask him. Ask him for help and ask him for deliverance. In the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he taught all of us to pray, deliver us from evil. And that is a prayer we all can pray, especially by the bullet. Deliver us from evil. And as God shows us or impresses on our hearts the things to do, whether it is to fight or it is to flight, let us do so fully trusting Him. Also at all times, watch your heart. Many times the bully becomes a bully, either to wreak vengeance on her bully or to assert his power over others so that he will not be bullied ever again. And we all know the saying, hurt people hurt people. And the only way we can keep hurts and bitterness from overwhelming us and turning us into bullies is if we have a real hope for justice and deliverance. The bullied become bullies because there is no justice and there is no hope for justice in sight. And the only way for us not to turn into bullies is if there is a real hope for justice and deliverance. And because of the sinfulness and fallibility of the human race, our hope cannot be in fellow human beings or human authorities or systems. Our ultimate hope for justice and deliverance can only be found in God, God who is the righteous judge of all the world. The historic cross and the empty tomb of Jesus is both proof and sign that God cares for the bullied and will work justice for them 
if they will trust him to save them and not become bullies to save themselves. Jesus himself was bullied. He was cancelled by his bullies, taunted by them, beaten by them, finally violently murdered by them. Jesus, who had the authority to destroy his bullies with a single word, would not become a bully to save himself. Instead, as he hung on the cross, Jesus overcame evil with good, and he overcame hatred with love and kindness. He prayed for his bullies. He even prayed for God to forgive them. And he died with those words on his lips, asking God to forgive them. And as Jesus died, we saw the justice of God. God would vindicate the bullied Jesus. And not even death can rob the bullied of justice. Because God would raise the bullied Jesus from the dead, he would come back to life, and God thereby declared him innocent of all that his bullies falsely said of him. And that day will come when unrepentant bullies will also be raised back to life not to be vindicated, but to face their final judgment and to receive the sentence of eternal torment where they will weep and they will gnash their teeth in pain forever. The first book of the Bible, Genesis, records how human beings became bullies. And the last book of the Bible, Revelation, reveals the promises of God to deliver justice and to save the bullied from bullies. And the vision described there of God's care for the bullied is that God himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So friend, God cares for the bullied. And if that's you today, God cares for you. God will save you. We come now to the third implication that the history of ancient Israel with God means for us as a church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Since God cares for the bullied, then the church must be a prophetic voice of hope and justice and hand of peace. To his people who were being bullied and who thought that God had forsaken them, God raised up a prophet and sent the prophet to them to proclaim these words to them. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. And this is in Isaiah 35. Say, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. God will come and save you. Now, as witnesses of Jesus Christ, the church is similarly sent by God to be a prophetic proclaimer of the hope of God's salvation. If the bullet comes amongst us, we must, with both word and practical help, offer to them the hope of God's salvation. But to be a credible prophetic voice, we must also speak justly and we must recognize evil as evil and not call it good. And here as a closing point, we are going to spend some time to consider how the church should speak regarding the ongoing Israel-Hamas war. Amid the violence that Israel is exacting in Gaza and the humanitarian crisis that it is causing it can be difficult, it can be confusing, and perhaps it is even embarrassing for some Christians to refer to Israel in the Bible. On the one hand, we cannot avoid the fact that Israel is the nation God had chosen from Old Testament times to reveal something of himself to the world. We cannot deny that Israel has a special call from God. On the other hand, at least on mainstream media, the general message is that Israel's use of force in retaliation to the attack and kidnapping of its citizens in October by Hamas is heavily disproportionate. In short, the media is telling us the bully has become the bigger bully. Some Christians have decried Israel and questioned how they can do so much evil. But other Christians have voiced support for Israel, seemingly downplaying or even ignoring the disproportionate use of force in their vengeance. Now, it is not possible to discuss the issue comprehensively in our remaining time this morning. But in light of the truth that we have learned from Scripture today that God cares for the bullied, then this sermon appeals to everyone who wishes to speak or to forward posts 
on the Israel-Hamas war or on any related issues. If you wish to do that, then do so with godly discernment and justice. Otherwise, you risk speaking as if you are speaking for God when God may well be disagreeing with you. In other words, you risk taking God's name in vain. And you may well be wrongly turning away people from God with what you are saying. So how can we think or speak about and respond to the Israel-Hamas war justly and in a manner that honours our God who cares for the bullied? Here are some handles for Christians who wish to engage with the issue. Firstly, we must recognise that the Israel-Hamas-Palestinian conflict stems from a complex history that involves not just these parties, it involves other powers who do not even live in the land but who have made decisions on behalf of the people who live in the land. It is a complex history. And so let us be very, very slow in making final judgments. Secondly, as Christians, we should have, and it is right for us to have a special concern for Israel. Genesis 12.3 is very clear that Israel has a special call from God and those who bless Israel will be blessed. In the New Testament, we have the example of Paul in Romans 10 to 11, who maintains that the nation of Israel continues to be special to God. And so Paul seeks Israel's welfare and salvation. Yet, while affirming Genesis 12, 3 and Romans 10 to 11, and seeking to bless Israel, it is also biblical for Christians to interpret these scriptures in light of other scripture like Romans 9, 6, which says not all who are born Israel is Israel. And we must answer the question with all these scripture in mind, who or what constitutes the true Israel today? I submit that the answer to this question and the implications are not as simple as many would make it out to be. Fourthly, today's brief survey of Israel's history in the Bible should inform our considerations that even while maintaining that Israel is God's special people, they are not always in the wrong, neither are they always in the right. And Israel, like all other nations, is not exempt from God's judgment for injustice. In fact, we may even say that it is in Israel's judgment that we can be so certain that God's justice is unbiased because He would judge even his special people. God's justice is both unbiased and true. Fifthly, any discussion and conclusion must include addressing the real lives that are being affected in the conflict, including the Palestinians who are facing homelessness and impending famine, and also the remaining Israeli hostages and their families. And notwithstanding genuine concern for all victims in general, as Christians, we have a special obligation to also consider the implications of our conclusions for our spiritual brothers and sisters, both Israeli and Palestinian Christians. If you need a starting point to begin thinking about these issues, I would recommend reading this article. Uh, it is an article on the Israel-Hamas war in the December 23 issue of the Methodist Message, and if you would like to, the QR code is there. If not, you can just Google it. Israel Hamas War, a clarion call for moral clarity. It is a short article that gives us a starting point to think about the Israel Hamas War in a biblically just manner. And seventh, the seventh handle is that the golden rule which is to do to others as you would have them do to you, the golden rule is an important measure of justice and integrity, even in this issue. If we put ourselves in the positions of an Israeli hostage, family or citizen, and if we will also put ourselves in the shoes of a Palestinian internally displaced person today, will we stomach what we are now thinking and doing and saying about the Israel-Hamas war? as just. And so these are seven handles for us to consider today so that we can speak rightly and justly. And we have spent a bit more time addressing this issue this morning because if we are to be credible witnesses to the world that God cares for the bullied, 
then Christian integrity and the fear of speaking rightly about God requires us, it demands us to be consistent in how we speak on this hot-button issue today. And may it not be the case that our speech promotes the false idea that God cares only for some bullied and not others. Instead, to the victims, to all victims of violence and war in Israel, Gaza, Ukraine, Russia, Myanmar, many other places in the world, and to all who are bullied, whether you are here today or perhaps those who will listen to this at some point, may you all know the hope of God's salvation. May you all hear God say to you, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come, He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come and save you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As a closing prayer, I've uh, chosen Psalm 27, and I'm going to invite all of us to pray this psalm responsively. Will you please respond with the words in both? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, my enemies, my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army beseech me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against me. Even then, I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At His sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my Saviour. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Amen.